how difficult has it made private equity as an asset class for some of these institutions, given that you're not seeing the exits that we once had? Yeah, we are, we are definitely in a distribution drought. And I, I think the dam of pent up exits that endowments, foundations, all of our clients, pensions, et cetera, have been waiting for, I think we, we, we counted the tally about 800 billion of exits that should have happened by now, but haven't. And that has definitely fed into some stress for institutions that were relying on those distributions to fuel their activities, philanthropically or otherwise. How much do you attribute this to a regulatory framework that makes it more expensive uh, to IPO versus there are a lot of companies in the private sphere that have inflated expectations for what they could get in the public markets. Yeah, well, th that's the thing. The, the private markets are very deep and dense, right? And so uh, the information that we have at Cambridge Associates, there are 17,000 buyouts, venture capital backed uh, companies that we track alone, right? And let's say we're, we're covering a big swath of the market. There's an average of how many IPOs in this country a year? Maybe 200. So most of the exits that we expect to see in the private markets will likely go by M&A. And as, as we said, a lot of the activity, transaction activity, is slowed basically to a trickle still. And we are waiting. As I mentioned, those pent up exits were like, Time's ticking here. Well, it raises this question, especially when you talk about endowments and other uh, foundations, institutions. Do they find private equity to be, a, to be a less attractive asset class because there are less reliable distributions as proven as has been proven out over the past few years? Lisa, I guess a couple of things, right? You've got to maintain a perspective. And I, I think what we've been saying at Cambridge as it relates to the private markets is you need to focus on the compass, not the clock. Right. So over the last year or two years, the markets have been the private markets have been very quiet. Fundraising is down. Distributions are down, as we've talked about one year performance in the private markets, which is not a good metric for measuring private market performance. Also kind of anemic. Right. And so longstanding experienced private markets investors, they look out. They're like, well, on a five year or 10 year basis, the private markets have outperformed publics. 300 to 400 basis points, and distributions will resume. They have to. This is not a, a roach motel for a capital. Eventually, the managers where, who have that money invested have to realize it and, and get that capital back to their investors. Given that patience that you kind of have mm -hmm. to have through a cycle like this, does it make sense to open up to retail investors who could potentially pull their money on a more regular schedule? That's a really interesting question for the GPs, the general partners that are raising these funds. And so as fundraising at the institutional level may have gotten a little quieter as those institutions are waiting for capital to come back before reinvesting into the asset class, as you've noticed and we've noticed, there's been an, an expansion of uh, private fund offerings, other forms of accessing a broader swath of, of retail investors. And that's definitely bringing capital into the space. I wonder, though, if it also is making it a bit more risky for some of the other institutions, just because you don't want to have to sell when you don't want to. You don't want to have to make an exit at an inauspicious time. I and mean, I guess just on a broader level, when you look at the different asset classes within private markets, private equity, private credit, uh, infrastructure, uh, some of the asset-based lending, has private equity become less attractive more broadly as a slice of that sort of alternative uh, allocation just because of some of these issues? Yeah, I mean, these, these are temporal in nature, right? So we know that private equity, the average hold period for a private investment is seven years. So if you're judging anything on a one or two year period, you're, you're not being patient enough. Um, and the long term returns of the private markets do tend to outperform public market options because the, the capital has a longer time to, um, to, to do its work and, and develop that kind of value that's coming back out. So really it's about, it's about patience and also understanding who you've invested with and if they are capable of delivering the kinds of returns that we're paying them for. Do you find that given where interest rates are now, the fact that you could actually get 5% without taking much risk, the fact that suddenly there are returns to be had, it isn't sort of this race to nowhere uh, and uh, this sort of ZERP world forever. Mm. Has that changed the appetite for some more alternative products? Does that serve a different role in some of the institutional portfolios? I mean, absolutely. With the end of ZERP and the rise of interest rates, private credit has blossomed, right? There's a lot of capital in private credit right now. The kind of re the one-year returns for private credit are better than the one-year returns for private equity and venture capital. But again, when you start moving out into a five-year period or a 10-year period, 
private equity and venture tend to start to crest and deliver the kinds of returns you expect. But private credit, make no mistake, has definitely been thriving in this environment. I wonder if it's going to be the same this time around. And I hate saying this time is different just because, you know, you always end up getting burned when you say that. Uh, but because there has been so much money that has flooded into these areas, because there has been such a race to get, mm -hmm. uh, to get deals done, do you think that there's been some cannibalization from the quality of some of these deals? Right. I, when I think about the amount of capital that's come into the space, and keep in mind, you know, the dry powder, the snowpack of dry powder is, is at an all-time high right now. But the vast majority of that capital is sitting in funds of $5 billion or more, right? And so one of the things that we're always reminding our investors at, at Cambridge Associates, our clients, is that this is not a monolithic space. While a lot of the capital may be going to the very top of the market, there are thousands upon thousands of managers doing their thing in the lower middle market, in the growth equity market, in secondaries, which has also been uh, blossoming lately this year and last year. And so it's a broad and diverse space. You got to pick your spots. You have to pick your spots. Just quickly, how much have you found that sort of the appetite risk, the appetite for risk has been increasing, decreasing, or staying about the same? Yeah. Well, if, if, you, if you look back, and we chatted about this, I think, last year, we had a chance to have this conversation. In 21-22, where, when we still were in ZERP, there was a big risk on element. Now, with the 50 basis point rate cut, does it feel like there might be a little loosening of, the, of, of, uh, of risk, of willingness to take more on? Um, well, we're seeing that from a leverage standpoint, right? Uh, spreads are tightening, there's a little more availability, covenants are loosening a little bit. That may release some of that pent-up exit energy that we are watching right now. 